All right, we're live. <laughs> All right. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you to those who are joining us live now. I'm going to go ahead and just get my own personal introduction here out of the way so that we can get on with the conversation. My name is Eric Maddox. I'm the host of Latitude Adjustment Podcast, and this is my first time doing it live. And uh, what else can I say about myself? Um, yeah, I hope to do more of these. And if you haven't caught the show, check it out at latitudeadjustmentpod.com. And this will be co-hosted by my longtime friend, sometime producer, and president of my nonprofit organization, Open Roads Media, Leila Mohaiber. And uh, I'll give her a chance to introduce herself, and then I'll introduce our guests for today as well. Great. Thank you, Eric. Leila. Thank you. Yes, I'm Leila Mulchaber. For those on my you know, personal page who are following, you know me, but for anyone who's a listener of the podcast or a friend of Sam or Duck, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to be part of this conversation, especially on the occasion of Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth, everybody. Um, we've been obviously seeing things in the news um, about all the things happening and what happened in Minneapolis. Eric did an episode with Sam and Duck, and so I'm glad to be able to meet them and ask them questions, take a kind of a deeper dive into the conversation that they had. Uh, my personal work is uh, with UNRWA USA. I'm the director of communications. Our work is focused on um, educating the American community about the plight of Palestine refugees in order to support um, the humanitarian efforts of the agency. I uh, have a personal commitment to um, justice. In fact, our organization um, made the decision to formally recognize Juneteenth. So I'm off today and um, having space to have this conversation, but I don't want to take up more time because more importantly, we have um, Sam and Duck to hear from. So back to you. All right. Oh, and just one quick note. I'm, I'm in Germany, if that matters to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I don't know if I team. said, but I'm in Virginia. <laughs> yeah, where we're all coming from. So my guests today, our guests today are Sam Abler and Duck Washington, and they will introduce themselves as well. But, uh, for some context, they were my most recent guests on the last episode of Latitude Adjustment Podcast, and they're coming to us from uh, uh, Minneapolis. So uh, first, Sam, would you like to introduce yourself to say, well, I guess your, your last name too, and where you are, and anything else you'd like to say about yourself, and then we'll move on to Duck as well. Um, Sam Abler, I live currently in Minneapolis, uh, been here pretty much my whole life on and off, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what do you need to know about me. I mean, we'll find out a lot in the next few minutes. Activism, I guess, is my main goal, yeah. bartender by day. <laughs> yeah, and I guess, yeah, we can, we'll, we're gonna learn a lot about you in the course of the next hour too. So Very yeah. accurate. <laughs> we, can, we, can, we can provide a little element of suspense. So, <laughs> Duck, take it from here if you want to just introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Derek Washington, but everybody calls me Duck like the bird. Um, I am uh, a theater artist uh, in the Twin Cities area who does a lot of, not, not all of my performances are social justice based, but quite a few of them are. Um, but I'm an actor, director, playwright, improviser, audio designer um, right here in Minneapolis. Uh, I've lived in the Twin Cities um, since 1995, um, but I'm originally from Lansing, Michigan. All right. It's a much better right. introduction. <laughs> it's not a competition. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's dive in there. So, uh, Leila, you want to fire off yeah, the first question? Yeah, again, I wanted to start off by wishing you a happy Juneteenth and ask you what Juneteenth means to you do you see it carrying any special significance in this moment? Uh, if either of you wants to jump in before the other, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on it. I'll jump in. Um, yeah, sure. I think I think Juneteenth is amazing. It's not it's not a holiday that like I really had the opportunity or or the awareness to celebrate. Uh, you know, the majority of my life, but over the last few years, as it's it's, as it's become more apparent, it, it seems it seems silly to me that we haven't taken the time to to recognize and celebrate uh, the end of slavery, um, which is what the Juneteenth celebration is. It's a celebration um, 
uh, and appreciation of the African American experience uh, and the ending of that that horrible time in our history. Um, you know, people. Um, I was just saying this the other day. People, you know, are, are are saying that they're worried that we'll forget about the Confederate history because these statues are going down or military bases are being renamed. Um, but that's not the history that we should be remembering. That what we should be remembering is that the, one of the most embarrassing times uh, in American history came to an end, and that's something that we should celebrate and use uh, as a platform for lifting the people up that it pushed down. Brilliantly said, and I absolutely agree with you. Sam, do you have anything that you'd like to add to what Tuck said? I mean, yeah, I fully agree with that. I think it's a time for people to understand and kind of recognize that we have a really dark, terrible history. And one of, like Duck said, one of the most embarrassing times uh, is recognized now that, you know, it ended finally, and now we have a bigger fight. But this, this major event has ended, but can now be celebrated for what it means, especially in our black, the black community. But I think for all communities of color, that really it is. It's important that it's being, it's been recognized nationally for a long time, but I think it's super important now that it's gaining momentum along with all the other things going on right now. Yeah, and let's hopefully, hopefully they'll make it into a federal holiday because it, right. it isn't currently a federal holiday. And it needs- yeah, absolutely right. Um, I'm from Virginia, like I mentioned earlier, and our state did declare it a, a state holiday. So that is some progress, um, but right. you're absolutely right because black history is American history. And so this isn't something that should be specific to one community. It should be celebrated by all because yeah. it was a very momentous occasion. And um, I, I hope that we see that in, in our near future. Um, I wanted to remind our, our guests and Eric, if you have not yet shared this uh, video on your Facebook, your personal pages, that you take a second to do that. And any audience members, I see there's at least 20 viewing us right now. If you could each hit the share button and help make this conversation a wider one, um, we will be taking comments from anybody who's tuned in and any questions um, alongside the questions that Eric and I have. But I'm going to pass the mic to Eric now for our next question. Yeah, I actually just have kind of a follow up on this first question too, and that is that my sense is that this, if this were to become a national holiday this year, right, that it would still, I would imagine, be somewhat. I mean, maybe this is a massive understatement, but bittersweet, right? This isn't Christmas, right? It isn't just something where you're just celebrating like something that's. Th- there's an element of this uh, that can be a national reminder of what hasn't been accomplished, also, right? In a sense. I think- maybe- yeah, I think I think that's the best kind of way to put it right now is I mean I think kids are taught a very not necessarily false history but a very uh omitted history and I think this is one of those things where it's we need to kind of start recognizing what we should be celebrating about our past and what we shouldn't be celebrating. And I think it's a good step in kind of being able to get that message out there that, you know, not all of these historic men are necessarily good people. Not all of these events were good. And I think this is one of those things where it's a very specific event, obviously, but I think it holds a broader meaning all around for people. I think that's the big symbolism, especially for this year, um, for the big, the bigger meaning behind it. Um, one of the uh, the slogans that that go along with Juneteenth is to celebrate, educate, and agitate. Um, and uh, I think I think if we we look at it with that idea in mind, um, we we will like with especially with that focus on educating and agitating um we'll we'll address the fact that we haven't come as far as we need to that the emancipation proclamation or the the 
you know, the general rule number three, which is what was delivered in Galveston, um, didn't didn't end racism. Um, the Thirteenth Amendment didn't end racism. The Civil Rights Movement didn't end racism. Electing Obama didn't end racism, um, and that that we sh but we should be learning more about the errors in our past and moving to to become a better America. Yeah. I'm going to move forward with the next question, unless somebody has something to add. Um, so, let's see, uh, I'm going to start with Sam since we started with Doug last. Uh, Sam, when did you first become aware of the of the concept of race, and how were you taught to understand what this meant for you? You know, I kind of I was adopted as a baby, and I grew up with white parents in a semi diverse family, uh, and it was one of those things I never really talked about. But clearly, I look very different from my parents, and so it was something that I always kind of understood, but it wasn't until probably almost middle school to where I understood more of, okay, I have two races, if not more, um, that I have to kind of understand. And it wasn't until, you know, black references were being thrown out at school or like things that I just didn't understand because I wasn't taught because my parents didn't teach because they didn't know how to raise a black child. And so it's, I was a product of in my environment, but I grew out of that to understand and embrace my culture. And so I think middle school is really where I became self-aware, I guess, of who I am and like my background. But I think it's always kind of been there, but never taught. Was there a specific moment when you realized things were going to be different for you? As a person of color? Yes, I remember we were on a family vacation and I was still fairly young, but of all places, we went to a Cracker Barrel in Alabama and my sister and my brother and I are all mixed. Um, my sister and I are darker and we waited like an hour and a half to get service. And I was kind of like starting to slowly put things together, but I didn't really understand. I kept asking my mom, but she didn't quite get it or didn't explain it. And then words were exchanged further on by the waitress and other staff mm -hmm. members. And that's when I kind of put it together that, oh, I am different apparently. And it is not a good thing, but why? but I was never taught why it's not a good thing or why it's a, you know, so yeah. I think that was earlier on, probably six, seven, maybe, yeah. which isn't fun. <laughs> of course. Doug, uh, I can do, do you recall the question? Do you want me to? to uh, yeah, I, I, I recall. Um, so um, I was always, I've always, I mean, I, I don't really have a memory of not being aware of my race. Um, growing up in a mixed household, um, you know, it was very easy to see that, um, that, you know, part of my family was black, part of my family was white. My brother and I were somewhere in the middle. Um, uh, and, and my parents did a really good job of, of making me aware that, that, that difference was going to be a thing. Um, uh, uh, but I, I mean, I don't think that there's any way that a parent can really prepare a black child for for some of the realities when they actually hit in real life. It's one thing, you know, to hear about them or to, to see it happen to, to Arnold on different strokes or, you know, um, something like that. But to actually, you know, be a child and have uh, a white man come up to you and call you the N-word, um, uh, put you in a put you in a whole different world, um, and so I think I think those were the lessons that that really like like really like brought home the book education I had been given to the to the realities of race, um, people being blatantly um, racist to you in public as a child. Um, you know, um, I had a couple instances with you know students on the playground. 
Um, you know, um, I remember a particular case where a student came up to me and told me I was dumb because my my mom was white and my dad was black. Um, um, and then, uh, uh, like again, I, I also had the restaurant experience where we went out to Red Lobster on a birthday, and the the, the server refused to put in our order because we were a mixed race family. Um, you know, those those lessons really hit home. Wow, that's very painful. And um, I'm grateful to both of you for being comfortable sharing that because it's important for people, including me, to hear uh, and to think about um, what that means for each of us. And I don't know if either of you have children, but like, I can't imagine what conversations are like that as a parent to try to prepare the kids, even though it doesn't do anything, like you said, kind of to in comparison to the actual reality. But um, I'm really sorry that that happened to both of you. That's messed up. Um, my next question is kind of uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, picking back on a lot of what you guys talked about on the podcast with Eric. And um, maybe I'll, I'll pass it back to Sam to start with the question that I have is what events, personal or otherwise, have been most pivotal in shaping your feelings towards the police? Oh, so many. Where to start? Um, I mean, I think I briefly touched on like my gay bashing in the last podcast with you, Eric, and the fact that the guy who murdered my friend in cold blood got six months and like 11 years probation. That alone is like my first major, major distinction on how, excuse my French here, fucked our justice system is here. Well, that uh, wasn't in Minneapolis, right? No, it wasn't. It's silly, right? Uh, correct. And um, so it's just, it's it's a matter of even here though, when even being little and be called the N word or, you know, uh, the F word when it was, I mean, it's still a slur, but you know, uh, by cops. I've been pulled over more times than I can count uh, for every reason you could possibly imagine including you just looked too black to me. Um, and so I just think there's not, I think I briefly touched on it too. Like I've felt more safe with community members, armed community members who I may or may not know just roaming our streets protecting it than I do with cops surrounding me. Uh, just because there's a lack of training and proper training with the police here, but it's an abuse of power that for some reason here especially just goes crazy. The fact that we've had like 10 shootings that were reported, 10 deaths rather, uh, in the last decade, and there were many, many more than that just here in Minneapolis is disgusting. It's, it's insane to me. And I don't know. It's too many, too many to recall. <laughs> it gets stressful after a while. Yeah. And just interject some con just to interject some context for our guests too. Like my understanding is that Minneapolis is a is known for being a very liberal city, right? Like correct. Like it, correct. It doesn't have very, that that excuse, so to speak, right? And that's and I think that's a big outrage too with people is. Like, you know, I've grown, I grew up here. I was raised here. I've lived here on and off for 26 years. Like I, I've been around this city and I think that's why people are so upset is there's always been this weird underlying racism, but the fact that it just keeps happening as opposed to isolated incidents, it just continues to get expand and expand. It's driving people up the wall. Whereas, I mean, I don't want this to sound callous in any way because I mean, there's clearly needs still to be justice for Breonna Taylor and the fact that Kentucky is, you know, generally a red state, but there's that mindset there that it's just, well, they're dead now. What you going to do? And I, I, we have a different mentality here now. Um, even like eight years ago when Black Lives Matter started, I think there was, uh, why are they, blocking the streets blah 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 why are they doing this and now it's galvanized into this global 
phenomena. And it's awesome to see, but it's at what cost? Thank you. So I remember um, as a child, there was a program introduced into my elementary school um, where they decided they wanted to, 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 to make children comfortable being around the police. Uh, so they had this program where they had this, this police officer named Officer Friendly who would regularly come to our school and give us ice cream and, you know, uh, just became like our, our, you know, our neighborhood buddy. Um, and so I grew up kind of with this, this, this idea of what police should be this community member, this, this, this friendly support, this person who was there to protect and serve me. Um, but when I became older and started to have actual interactions with the police, um, uh, I became aware very quickly um, that that was, that that was a fallacy, that that, that that person uh, when they arrived at the scene um, was arrived, was arriving specifically with the intent of not believing um, that I was, that I was, that I was innocent or I was a victim or that I was somebody who needed help. Um, even in instances where I've had to call the police, um, generally uh, most of the police have, have arrived with uh, a lot of generalized assumptions. A lot of them have presumed that I was the one who perpetrated the crime. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's happened, that's happened to me multiple times, um, you know, and I'm a person who wants to be a good citizen, who wants to help people. Um, and it's scary that that this this system that that should be there to protect everyone and make everyone feel safer uh, uh, has become the thing that I'm the most afraid of out of anything. you know, um, uh, nothing terrifies me like the police. Um, I've been pulled over for countless reasons because my headlight looked dim at the time they pulled me over. Um, I got pulled over because there was a hailstorm, and five minutes after the hailstorm, uh, there was hail damage to my car, like there wasn't to everybody else's car. Um, uh, all any any kind of fabricated excuses uh, that they can that they can think of, um, um, they'll use to pull us over and harass us to to have us get out of our cars, to cuff us, throw us in the back. You know, I'm, I'm very fortunate in the fact that um, none of my interactions with the police have escalated to a point where I've come to physical harm. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but not everyone can say that. And that could be any of us at, at any stop. Um, and we, we just can't let that be the case anymore. So how do you feel now looking back on that school program? of whatever you call that, like normalizing the relationship with the police or, I mean, do you feel like that was just performative nonsense? Do you feel like it was well-intentioned, but tone deaf? Like what, what I think, it, I think it was well-intentioned. I think, I think, I think the, the unfortunate thing is, is, is that um, like the kind of the olive branch was extended, but they didn't, uh, but they didn't do the work to make the police force match their representative. Um, you know, like a lot of times when you're looking into diversity, a lot of times people work really hard to get that person in the door um, that is a person of color, that is a person of difference, but then they don't set up the environments that make them feel comfortable and sustained. Um, I think that's kind of what happened here. He was the uh, that officer friendly was that was that voice of encouragement and that 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 you know, olive branch of friendship. Um, but what you find in the inside when you really interact with the police didn't match it. Uh, and so in that regard, I, I, f I think it's more unfortunate. Um, if the police turn themselves around, I think that they that's the kind of work they're gonna end up needing to do to, to make us feel comfortable. But I, we're so far from that right now. And I don't, don't really know that officer friendly is gonna cut it anymore. Just one quick, statistic to kind of point out that I think might be helpful for our audience if they're not familiar with Minneapolis and policing there. And it's something that you pointed out in our conversation, Doug. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that 94% of the police in the Twin Cities do not live in Minneapolis. They're not from there. 
in our residence. And I did some further digging on that. And I mean, it's Twin City. So I was like, well, do the rest of them just live in St. Paul? And like 20% live in St. Paul. So that still leaves 70, what, 6%, 74% who don't live in either of the Twin Cities. That's the police forces coming in from outside. And that's one of the lowest residency rates in the nation, what I understand. For well, the I think force. part of that problem is that they're not even close to the met like in the metro area. A lot of them come in. I mean, like Bob Kroll, for instance. The, our Minneapolis's David Duke is lives in Hugo, which is far He's enough. The chief away. of police, is that right? Uh, he is the head of the police union. Okay. Correct. Um, but even that, like. Hugo is such a far community from the Minneapolis area and St. Paul area that it's just, it doesn't make sense to have someone leading a police union that doesn't live in the city. And I think there's, I think that's a problem is you can't necessarily guarantee that people in Minneapolis are going to sign up and want to be a cop, but there needs to be some kind of system where you're placing those officers in their own specific communities if you're going to keep them around, you know? And that, I think that's a major problem right now. And I think that, um, you know, when you look at the the demographics of the areas that they're coming from, like while while the t Minneapolis is, 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 you know, fairly diverse and liberal as we were talking about before, um, uh, the environments become much more white and conservative um, when you get to those outer ring suburbs that a lot of those police are are coming in from. Um, you know, um, uh, a lot. I, I don't know if you all are mis familiar with like Michelle Bachman, um, but like like that's where her uh, base basically lives um, is in those areas. Those mm -hmm. those really red um, white neighborhoods. Um, and those are the people who are coming in to police us. Not, not to say that you can't live out there and not, not be a racist, but, um, um, but it definitely is a, it's definitely not re represented of, of where we are here in the Twin Cities. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Put up, remember the, the officer who shot Mike Brown and Ferguson also lived in a predominantly white community that wasn't Ferguson. Um, so, I mean, I wonder how much of this is also just indicative of a trend. And right. Yeah. Product of environment, if you want to blame it on that. But I also mm. think it's, you know, I mean, there's so many things that you could dive into that mm. make it an issue. But I grew up in a predominantly white, somewhat mixed, very meth heavy area in a place called Anoka. But like, even then, it's the police there are very, the whole town is very conservative. My uncle is a rep Republican U.S. Senator for that county, and it's it's very specific and one-minded. I I think, and I think that comes with a lot of issues in its own right. And I think even the police force there, even a lot of them are members of that community. <laughs> but there's so much misinformation and not enough training that it kind of teeters one way, you know, even the members within their own community can't keep their shit together almost. And it's terrifying. Well, and, and it might be just drawing conclusions, but I have to think that, you know, like a lot of those, a lot of those outer suburbs were, you know, they were generated out of the idea of white flight. Mm -hmm. of people trying to flee from the, the nasty city or the urban, you know, the urban culture of the city. Um, and so if that's the foundation of where you live, if that, the, if that idea is the mindset, um, how is that going to inform your biases when you come back in to police the people there? Right. Yeah. The whole reason why you're living where you're living was to avoid the community that you're now policing, or at least that's why your parents or their parents mm -hmm. left. Yeah. You get, you got to think that that's somehow, trickling into people's like the brains of their kids when they're raising them. Um, I got to take a hard turn here into a, a different kind of question. And uh, 
Yeah, I'm putting you both on the spot. So feel free to <laughs> deflect it or address it however you want to, obviously. But um, something that I've wondered for a while, and I suspect a lot of people are, have wondered and maybe are afraid to ask, like, why do you think that there hasn't been another like galvanizing leader like Martin Luther King or Malcolm X or pick any of these like major figures from like the 1960s? Um, and do you think that that's the, the lack or the absence of that has played a role in halting progress? I, if you don't mind, Duck, uh, I appreciate it. Um, I, I think you could argue that there have been multiple leaders that have gone above and beyond to continue fighting for this. The problem lies within the country and the people in it that don't necessarily want to acknowledge the problem at hand. I think the civil rights movement kind of made everyone feel better about uh, people of color and more opportunities, but clearly that wasn't the case. But I think it's been kind of suppressed for so long on our side um, and gone unnoticed. And then when it did, like again, when Black Lives Matter first kind of became a huge instance, or when you know when Trayvon Trayvon Martin died, and it was these movements get quickly shut down because there are other things, you know, because people are protesting in the street because some guy was defending his neighborhood and they get immediately shut down and then that problem goes away. Like you said earlier, like I made a post and telling, reminding people not to give up because I think people get complacent with little progress instead of major, major change. And I think that's where we have so many leaders now. And I think social media is a big part of that too, is there's not one major person at the head of this. It's all of these voices are being heard. Everyone is galvanizing into being a leader for change. And I think that's the argument I can make, but I, you know, I think people were complacent at one point and they are no longer complacent. I wonder, it's, I mean, it's hard for me to know for sure, especially I'm not old enough to have been around when Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were alive. Um, but I, I also wonder how much um, their, their assassinations play in building them as being these other level leaders, mm -hmm. you know, that they, because they've become martyrs for, for, for our causes. Um, you know, I think I think sometimes we um, lose the 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 humanism of of them that you you know that you might that the, how you know the places where they align with a Colin Kaepernick or you know um, other other leaders that are out there pushing forth you know ideas of of resistance you know um, ideas that that we can be a better a, be, a better society. Um, and I think, I think people lean on Martin Luther King in a way that is, um, in a, like, that is detrimental. Um, I think, I, I think Martin Luther King is, was amazing and what he did is amazing. Um, but, um, the white narrative has found ways to manipulate the things that he did and said, um, to, to not reflect reality in a way that makes us, you know, uh, makes him to out to be a standard that none of the rest of us can live up to that he didn't even necessarily live up to. Um, I was I was saying to someone the other day, you know, like I shouldn't have to be Martin Luther King for you to not kill me in the street. But then again, you killed him in the street too, or on the balcony, or whatever. Um, uh, but that's you know, like because every time somebody, every time there's one of these issues arises, it's an immediate character assassination. Did they steal some Skittles? Were the what were they what were they wearing? Um, you know, did they resist? Did they do everything that the officers told them to do? And and it's not it's not like we shouldn't have to be saintly not to die. Um, and I think that sometimes 
that image is put on us and be like, you're not, you're not the appropriate acting African American. You're not the appropriate acting black person. Um, and therefore your, your mistreatment is justified. And it's, it's horrible that way. <sighs> Sorry guys, I had my father enter the room because he's really eager to be listening to our conversation and his audio is not working. <laughs> so I had one ear here and one eye there. Um, we're seeing a lot of people uh, tune into this conversation, which I think is really important. The things that you both just said are critical for people to be hearing and to be thinking, to rethink history, to rethink these leaders. I think uh, I was reading an article recently about how the movement is taking more of a grassroots approach and that there's leaders throughout, like you said, Sam, and with social media, we have this ability to kind of approach this um, movement in a very different way. So, um, I just implore anyone who's watching, who's you know looking for an MLK to take charge before they get behind this movement to think more critically about it and realize that that, that isn't um, prohibiting this movement from being effective. Um, so the next question that I have for y'all is um, about your position on what seems to be the three main avenues for addressing systemic racism and policing. You know, we hear about reform, we hear about defunding and abolition. I certainly have my opinions on this, but I wanted to know um, what is your preferred strategy of those three? Um, if either of you wants to jump in, I don't want to choose who goes first, whoever feels most comfortable. If you'd like to go, Dr. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I think, I think that there are different levels of, of embracing all three of those um, avenues. And maybe the, the correct answer is a combination of multiple things. Um, I think the thing that like, like, I think, I think the idea of reform is something that a lot of people are a little bit more comfortable with, but I also think that it's probably the most difficult to, to do um, because the system is, is rotten. It's built on a, a systemic racism from its origins. You know, the police were really formulated to, to, to police brown bodies, to, 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 to regulate them. Um, and so how you get, how you reform so deeply in the core that it, that it gets rid of that implicit racism that it has, um, I think is, um, is, is, is a really, is a, it seems like a, a, a monumental task. Um, it seems easier to me um, to, to just uproot the system and, and build a new system, um, you know, and then, you know, figure out exactly who needs to be doing the work that the police are, is currently doing. Um, does it need to be a police officer? Does it need to be law enforcement? Can it be a social worker? Can it be, um, can it be a medical professional? Can it be a counselor? Um, can it be some kind of community representative or organization? Um, uh, but the, the mindset, the rules, the, the laws, the, all, all of those systems um, are all inherently biased and, you know, support the way that our police think and are trained. So, um, uh, I, 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 I think reform is going to be hard. I I, <laughs> Go on, Sam. I agree. I mean, there's arguments you can make, obviously, for all, both sides for all three issues. But I think the smartest is abolishing the system that's in place. I think there's, I mean, obviously, we have to consider there's going to be crime. People exist uh, to, you know, maybe cause trouble, but I think it's finding ways to be able to de-escalate that. I mean, I think our military is trained to de-escalate situations. If they can take down far more dangerous people without using force, there are better way, you know, and I think training is one way, but again, that costs money, that costs, that, that takes time. It takes effort on both sides. And I think that picture scares people, but I think abolition is the smartest way if you do it correctly. I think, you know, we don't see detectives 
and shields monitoring our streets 24 seven and making sure that there isn't trouble going on, but they're able to do their jobs effectively most of the time and still be able to bring people to whatever justice that is in that case. And so I think that hierarchy or that tiers, the tiers of how police work really needs to be massively adjusted. And I think it starts with not policing the streets, responding solely to calls. And this is strictly on a, if we're keeping the police in as a system. Uh, but I think it's important that, again, like if we're going to have police, that they be members of the community. And I think it's also batshit crazy to me that police aren't considered civilians at that point like that you know i think there is something i read uh i apologize if whoever had credit for it never gets it but uh you know holding police accountable like contra like private contractors do or plumbers they have their own private insurance keep yourself accountable if you're gonna shoot someone you better be ready to pay for it um if not <laughs> go to jail for it but i think it keeping people in line uh, and having, I guess, if you want to call it collateral, I guess, if you wanted to be crazy, but there are many, there are many ways you could go about this. And I think like Duck said, like he, reform is the hardest to do, takes the most time and costs the most money. And I think defunding and then shifting and, Starting over is the best option and replanting and reseeding how the system works, I think is a big step. And mental health screening for sure. Well, and then I was I, I heard recently that to become a barber in the Twin Cities takes you have to go through more training than you do to become a police officer uh in the Twin Correct. Cities. Not that I don't want my barbers to be trained, but um, uh, I definitely yeah. want my police officers to 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 go through some more of that training so that they're not out there dealing with things like in intense situations without knowing how to de-escalate or you know or even you know operating under a police union that specifically you know has said that they don't like that idea and want them to be warrior trained. Um, uh, I I think I think. Like there are some very simple. I need you to come now. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, hold on. I apparently there's an emergency I need to deal with. I will be right back. Okay. Thank you, Ted. Uh, yeah, like you said, though, I think it's important uh, to kind of understand what the basis for that is. Um, ref ab abolition seems like the best route and that's strictly because it like, like representative ilhan omar said here you know this place it's the system is rotten to the root and you need to be able to recognize that and adjust it and uh i like i said i think i touched on it again in the podcast the last podcast like the community here is so strong and awesome Everybody has been helping each other. There's safety in numbers here. And I've seen one police car actually roaming around the in, in the last week or so. And it's just been, it's, it's slightly alarming because it's kind of the quiet, possibly before the biggest storm. Uh, but at the same time, there's, there's hope that we are able to do this, you know, and people keep talking about, well, in like Finland or the Netherlands, cops don't carry guns and there's maybe a couple shootings every couple of years, but they also have a very, a huge lack of diversity in their countries, but they also, their countries also have a deep rooted system of racism as well but are more okay with it. 
it's just kind of the way it is there, especially like, uh, you know, it's just, it's the slavery trade in Denmark and other places like that, Holland, where it's almost kind of just, it's not necessarily a celebrated history, but it's kind of just like, a, okay, well, it happened, so. There's and, some pretty messed up casual racism stuff. Yeah, mean, as a person that's in Europe, like, I don't want to generalize about the whole continent because each country's kind of got its own thing, but but yeah, it's I notice it in ways that are just different in the yeah. in the US. Yeah, and so uh, you know that that police system may work there. They also have clearly very different gun laws, and so I think what people fail to understand here is that this goes way beyond just only carry tasers and pepper spray only you know train them better to do whatever and it, it ends up turning into how do we weed out all of these not even just racists but people who abuse power i mean even officers of color yeah. can abuse power that it, it it stems to a bigger issue of what what is the sole purpose of the police system and how can we completely change it, not just fix it, but change it and shake it up. And I think that's the, that's the scary part, but there has to be some kind of resolve at some point. And I, we can, I think people are scared to come up with that resolve. And I think it's going to be kind of a plateaued issue until it really takes hold everywhere else too. Something that I've heard is a few times it's really stuck with me is that while we're having a conversation about reform, there's maybe a built in assumption in that question that the system's broken instead of functioning exactly how it's supposed to. Oh yeah. I've hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, if, and, you know, people keep talking about, you know, going back to normal or, you know, they just want things back to the way it was, uh, you know, mostly referencing COVID, but like, no one wants this, this, the way it was. This is the exact point we're trying to make is that we were all okay with the civil rights movement kind of being the last big step and then the 92 riots and then all of these things but then complacency and being only okay for so long as opposed to getting out there accepting the fact that you're going to be fatigued because you're fighting for a better cause and i think that's that's the biggest issue i mean mm. We have so many officers here. I mean, it's a choice. I make very good money as a bartender. I'm paying my way through, eventually going to be paying my way through med school by myself. And I could, if I didn't like my job, I would leave it and find something that pays better. Police officers can do the same thing. It is not a, yeah. it's not an obligation to have this job. And so I think the fact that there's such a lack of people or of solidarity, solidarity on their end during all of this just even further proves the fact that like something needs to happen. If you're not okay with a coworker killing someone in cold blood and you're very okay just going back to that job knowing full well that job is eh, whatever, like, how, like <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. There are many other things you could do, but I mean, it seems to me like if these actions don't represent you as a police officer, there should be nobody more outraged than you are when you see what's being done in your name. Right. Like, right? So where yeah. is that? Maybe that's happening and I'm missing it, but like, where is that? You know? Exactly. Like, I just like, I don't get, I'm held accountable if I, if I serve a minor booze, if I like what, you know, if I overserve someone, I'm on the hook for that. How in the world are people not held accountable for murder mm -hmm. in any sense? You know what I mean? And it's just, it's crazy to me. It's, 
I mean, there's and there's there's so many things that come out of this too, and, and it's it's. I've got to push us forward a little bit just because we're running a little bit short on time, which I kind of I knew was going to happen because we're dealing with so many heavy issues. Um, just for the audience and also to let you know, Sam, because I don't know if you can see our chat, but um, uh, Doug had to leave. He had an urgent personal matter. I don't know the nature of it. Um, I hope everything's okay. But uh, So you're going to be the focus for the next few minutes. Um, all right, great. So... Yeah, another pretty loaded question. So uh, regarding the violence, and first of all, I want to preface this by asking you, what kind of violence have you witnessed? You've been at the protests. So first of all, what violence have you witnessed um, in the protest? And then your opinion on when violence is ever a legitimate element of protest. Is there ever a time when it's, when it's justifiable or is it never justifiable? I think it's always it's just so depending on. Well, so I first, guess, what violence have you seen? I guess very, that's a very intense way <laughs> jump right into that answer. But well, first I think, of all, what violence have you seen? Have you seen what? What have you actually seen yourself? Uh, I mean, I've I've been pepper sprayed a few times, uh, cuts, bruises. I've watched people get shot in the head and the body with rubber bullets. Uh, I personally wasn't there the day that the semi truck ran in whether it was an accident or whatever like that's a terrifying experience uh, but i know people who were there uh, i've seen numerous friends get arrested uh you name it i have there's a former co-worker colleague of mine who is in critical condition with a brain hemorrhage and a fractured skull because of a rubber bullet like and that's just and that's just to keep the peace and imagine, you know, like if they had full tactical gear and all of these things, like it's it's a terrifying thing to to think of, like that freedom of speech also entails being maced and pelted with things. And they're not tiny little bullets either. They are very large rubber bullets and it's you know and this isn't my first round of protests ever i remember a few years back i was doing some protests for things and it was you know i got shot multiple times like beating bait guns and all and rubber bullets and all these things and i'm just like this doesn't solve anything if anything you they're they tr purposely try to fuel the fire in order to spark a reaction and it's it's not great, but I think I think protests and riots are necessary. I mean, gay rights wouldn't have happened unless a, the most brave black trans woman on earth wouldn't have thrown that first rock at Stonewall. You know, like there have been riots and protests for centuries. And no, they don't always necessarily get things done, but they make they get the message across and at some point it's it's like a wildfire you know there's just there's beauty in the destruction after a while you just let it regrow and i think it's kind of the same thing as people people are suppressed and suppressed for so long eventually they're going to explode knowing full well that there better be some beautiful growth out of it we're not doing this because we're angry and then we just want to mess things up. We're doing it because we want to see the beauty after afterwards. And I think that's an important thing to realize is like, closed mouths don't get fed. You know, you can, you can be as peaceful as you want for as long as, but unless you have a system in place that acknowledges that you're, just dead fish in a barrel essentially and uh, you need to you need to make your voice heard in order to create change and i i mean and you can always argue there are good ways and bad ways to go about that all day every day but at the end of the day if those ways are creating progress and moving things forward 
they're doing something right. And that's kind of how I look at it is if they're creating, if they're creating any kind of change or creating a platform for people to use to create that change, they're more than okay, more than accepted. And it should also be pointed out that I think I saw an article about your interview with you where you're you're a part of these cleanup efforts too. Like you're going in after the protests and like the next day when there's fire damage or whatever there has been. I mean, I'm not on the ground, so I don't know what the visuals other than what I've seen the cameras pointed at on TV. And I also know that a lot of times what the camera shows you, well, there's a lot of what it's not showing you too, right? right. Like when you zoom in, you can make an entire city look like an apocalypse. And if you zoom out just a little bit, you realize that it's all actually pretty localized. I don't know. Well, and, and that's what it is. It is all fairly localized damage. Like, I, I mean, it was spread out throughout the city, but like a lot of areas went untouched. But I think it was also an effort to just clean up our city, period. You know, I think this was a good opportunity especially with the person who somehow got to be in charge of this place, uh, you know, created all these, or made all these comments about the thugs rioting and looting and all of these stupid things. Like he's fueling the fire for us to show how strong and amazing our communities are. And I think, I mean, part of that is if it gets burned down, did it up fix it, call it a day. There's, it's just gonna set you back farther to let it be or to whine about it instead of doing something about it. And I think, like, I think I showed you like a, there was an article or like little video article news thing that was done for me here about me cleaning up. Yeah. But even that like didn't show the fact that I was the only one cleaning up. There were gawkers everywhere people taking pictures and people capitalizing on a moment. And I even had people walking up to me and asking if it was my business that burned to the ground. And I said, no, I'm just cleaning it. And they said, oh, okay. And walk away. But like, if that had been my business, would you be willing? <laughs> like, it just doesn't make sense. But like, mm -hmm. but that's just such a small group of people. Like I'm just one of thousands that have done their part to clean up the community and do amazing things. You know, I don't consider myself some God or some special guy because I grabbed a broom. I just consider myself a very proud member of my community and I'm willing to express that by cleaning it up. But I mean, yeah, you can definitely know there's definitely damage here. Uh, definitely terrible destruction, but I think in the grand scheme of things, a lot of people like to capitalize on that and they don't see the bigger picture of there's damage, but there's more cleaning up and beauty being done than anything else and revitalizing of the communities. Um, okay. I have a quick time management question. Yeah, Just, uh, do your thing. I don't know how Show the software everything. that we're using works. Layla, is it going to be like an hard out it, an hour or can we keep going over if we need no, to? No, I think... Uh... I think we have as much time as we want with the limit on, I think it's like two or five hours for the okay. platform. This particular session, okay. I think we can go over the hour. Okay. Um, but of course- As long as it's okay with you, time, Sam. Yeah. Like, I don't want to keep you here indefinitely. Okay. Yeah, I'm good I mean, for another, another like 30, 45 okay. minutes for me, so. Okay. And I don't know that we'll need that much time, but uh, we've got a couple of questions left that I'd like to get yeah. to. If possible. I'm okay with that. I love hearing myself talk, so I'm okay with that. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so, the best, you're like the you dream kind of guest. That's amazing. Um, I just want to point out, I, I had put a comment on the screen earlier for a long time. I, I was going to mention it, and I kind of forgot that I had put it up there. Um, Laura Lucero from New Mexico was saying that she thinks the power of the movement is that it does not have a leader or figurehead. It's unstoppable because it's so kind of uh, grassroots. Um, hi to Laura. She's one yeah, of our amazing you. friends and listeners. And there's other comments happening. So maybe even after, 
after we end the broadcast. Sam, if you want to take a look and if there's anyone you want to respond to since we're kind of up against the clock. But I wanted to ask as my final question, you know, what are one or a few things that you want white people or non-black people of color to remember or to do? You know, I think and this may sound harsh, but uh, know your place, but know that you have a place in this fight. And I think that's the biggest thing is people are, oh, I, I don't have money to donate. I can't go out and clean up because it's I don't want to get sick. I don't blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's a million excuses not to do something. You just need to do something. And I think knowing your place, I mean, especially during the protests, like um, it was beautiful to just see just a sea of white people linking arms and protecting all these beautiful black bodies because they are using their privilege because they know that they have the ability to do that. Those are the kinds of beautiful things that we like to see, you know, don't capitalize on and don't profit from people of color, support people of color. And I think those are the big things, donate, especially today, but, and not just today, but every day support black businesses, support black business owners, um, neighbors, friends, family, understand that this isn't a political issue, this is a human rights issue, you know, if, and like, and I'm working on that with my family right now. They're all very Republican conservative people, and but they have a black person in their family, more than one, and still they still don't get it. And so it's educate yourself. It's not my job to educate you, but it's my job to correct you if you're doing something wrong or doing something in a way that isn't actually helpful. And that's kind of my big thing is educate know your place, but know that you have a place. We need you too. And I want, you know, like in, indigenous Native American people are should be fighting right alongside us. This is their land it was taken from them. You know, this is a movement for us, but this is a movement to get back and change a system that has oppressed not only black people, not only indigenous people of America, not even, you know, immigrants, everyone. And I think that's the big thing. Get out and vote. I can vote. <laughs> Please vote. <laughs> that's my big thing. Beautifully yeah. said. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And, and maybe something to add to the, the voting part too is like, for people who don't think that they're the right person to run, run, <laughs> you know, we need, we need more diversity, like on the ticket. Right. Um, like I want people to realize like this system is built off rich people profiting off the poor. And we need to start shifting how this system operates. We need more people like AOC and Ilhan Omar and people who are, who come from different backgrounds, who are able to express their voice, who understand how communities work. And I think that's the first step is like, why do we have all of these people who just don't get it in power? It just ma makes no sense. And there should be some knowledge behind it, but I think there should be more knowledge. There should be book and street smart, not just book smart. And all we have is book smart right now. It's scary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's scary. <laughs> but I mean, change is come. Change is happening. Change is coming. It's and it's kind of a beautiful thing to see. And like you said, like we need to be able to uh, That's all right. <laughs> yeah, you know, we have to be able to like recognize. I mean, the two leaders that we have right now aren't necessarily great. There are other ways to change the system too. So, are you talking about the two presidential candidates? Correct. Yes, they're like Voldemort. They refuse to say their names. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, we'll, we'll abide by that rule. We can't do it. <laughs> All right, so I got I got one more question, and then uh, I, I I guess we could look at the questions that are coming from the people who are tuning in too. I haven't looked at the comments in a minute, but um, at least my my last question is. I, the first time that we talked, well, this a couple of weeks ago, I guess, I asked you if you felt safe. And for those who haven't heard the podcast yet, I invite you to go back and listen. I don't want to paraphrase your answer to that. I think people should just hear it. Hmm. But what will it take for you to feel safe and like you're truly being afforded equal rights and protection under the law? I mean, oof, that's tough. It's just, it's a matter of like, I shouldn't have to fight for just being a person. I shouldn't have to wake up every morning and know that it's going to be just slightly more of a struggle than someone else uh, solely because I'm black. Didn't have a choice in that, but I love it. Highly mel melanated and beautiful. But you are. Uh, <laughs> but I think like safety is such a foreign term to me because I've never actually felt safe. Uh, and it's just, you know, I'm not a saint. I do things. I I've broken the law, but the fact that I'm terrified and heart races or whatever, all these things, just because I see a cop like a mile away doing something completely different is like, a shouldn't be a feeling that people have, you know, they should feel the opposite of that. And it's, uh, I feel I'm feeling safer knowing that there's less policing and that the community is here for each other and really looking after each other. And I think I touched on it in the podcast too, about I got a couple, uh, I won't call them death threats. I won't go that crazy, but they were weird messages that I received and caused concern. But I, you know, I notified a buddy of mine and like they watched over my house while they slept. And like just that, that those kinds of little things make me feel way safer than a system and a, poly, uh, a structure set in place to intimidate instead of protect and serve. And I know I'm getting, I'm slowly feeling safer, just slowly, but it shouldn't ever have to be, should have never come to that in the first place. You know, I should, I should feel safe waking up every morning and walking out my door, you know, and the fact that I don't feel that way is very, very sad. <laughs> Even here in like Northeast Minneapolis, quietest part of Minneapolis probably, but still there's racist heroin addict across the street, shitty people all over police precinct down the street. You know, it's, it's everywhere. You can't escape it. <laughs> but you gotta I mean, the, the, theoretically, when you see a cop down the street, I guess the, the feeling you're supposed to have is they're keeping me safe right now. You know, right. not is there an imminent threat to my safety? Right. You know? Well, and then it makes you, I think it also like, and a part of that is just how I grew up too, is like, I, sh like I said, I've, broken the law, whatever weed smoke, whatever you want to call it. Like I've done things, but like, even if I'm not doing something, I shouldn't make myself feel like I'm a criminal just because I see a cop car. You know what I mean? Like, and that's, and that's, and that's kind of the fucked up things that have been embedded again. Sorry for the French, uh, embedded in my brain that, I think also kind of create a bigger issue just, and I'm not, I know I'm not the only one, but there are these issues put in place by the man, the white man that have suppressed us. I mean, colorism is a real thing. You know, I've been getting so much flack because I'm light skinned. I don't understand the plight of black people 
who happen to be darker than me. And I think it's it's turning into uh, whose trauma is worse as opposed to we all have trauma, we all have a shared experience. And I'm trying to get it back to that point of, we all have a terrible, horrible history of trauma. How do we come together and fix that and change that and heal from that? You know, I have a kind of spontaneous question then along those lines, because you're mentioning colorism and then there's, there's other issues embedded within the issue of institutionalized structural racism mm -hmm. and where there can even be contention within these communities. And, if you feel comfortable speaking to intersectionality and this element of your identity as a gay man, how is that informed? Like, I don't know, the, the level of acceptance that you feel um, within certain communities and how is it informed? How has that made your, your struggle or your feeling of safety or how has that made things different for you? Just to make it really, really I think broad. That's, that's been kind of my problem. Like I said, like growing up in a white, parent household, mixed household, but white parents didn't really know how to raise black children. I mean, don't hold it against them, but I think, you know, I was never black enough to be black. I was never white enough to be like hanging with the white kids. I was always like that awkward one in the middle, but I was, because I was raised in a semi-middle class family, I had enough socioeconomic status to kind of weasel my way in. But, you know, especially when I eventually came out, like it, the black community was the hardest to be accepted in because of, I mean, there's just a long history. I mean, we can see it right now with the black trans women that are being killed and beaten by members of their own community. Um, and I think it, comes from kind of that like same in like Latino culture, that machismo like attitude of you got to kind of be a man, you got to be this kind of way. Anything else is awful. And, um, excuse me. And it, it kind of slowly fucks with you. And I think that's part of my problem too, is that, you aren't fully able or i guess i for me personally i wasn't really fully able to understand where my role in this fight is until i really kind of just decided like colorism is gross why do i why is my experience lesser than because of the shade of my skin like where it's the same fight within our own community and it's really sad to see, but it's again, this mentality put on us from years of oppression and systemic racism that kind of tears its way down. And it's just, uh, it's frustrating. <laughs> it's frustrating. I don't have anything to add to that other than I, I feel your frustration <laughs> as you describe it. You know, it's not right. mine, but I, but I, but I feel what you're saying. Um, I mean, I could keep having this conversation, right. man, because I'm, I'm here to learn <laughs> and I could keep picking your brain all day long. Um, but I, I guess the, the thing to do now, cause we didn't really discuss how we were going to end this was, <laughs> I, I think one thing I want to make sure that we do is if there's anything that you haven't said that you feel like you want to get out there, say it. And also if there's any, uh, any resources uh, that are in, I guess, would they be re resources in need of support? So any organizations in need of support that you'd like to direct people to? I'd also tell them, look, if you just go to the episode that we did, if you go to latitudeadjustmentpod.com forward slash podcast, our episode is the most recent one. If you scroll down, you will see between Sam and Duck, I think they recommended 17 organizations. So no excuses for not finding one. <laughs> like right. they recommended tons of stuff. There's supplemental videos that you can watch there. Um, all sorts of additional stuff beyond listening to the podcast and sharing this video with your friends. 
But um, it's linked in the comments just in case okay, anyone's great. watching. The great. most recent comment from the podcast is the link to the um, episodes. Okay. So yeah, you can go even if you don't want to check out the podcast. You know, you can you can go there just to get the information uh, that was related in it. But back to you, Sam. If there's is there anything that you'd like to add um, or call people's attention to before we go? I mean, again, just like it's knowing your place, but knowing that you have a place in this fight and using your knowledge and experience to do something about it. Um, whether it's big or small. And I think that's kind of the thing right now with people are getting crazy about, well, you're not doing as much as I am for activism or you're not fighting this much or you're not posting things. So you're not, you don't care. And it's not about that. It's how can we come together as a community, whether it's big or small and create change. And I think that's the first step is like, this isn't to divide, this is to provide people the opportunity to become an equal nation and live in this American dream that's been a bullshit lie for so many centuries and now can actually become a real thing. But like, also know that LGBTQIA plus rights are still an issue. Black trans lives matter. Like there's so many issues within issues going on and just really, this is an important fight, but there are so many fights within this fight and they all need to come to a head. They all need to be voiced. They all need to be heard. They all need to be supported. So do research support black businesses, not just today on Juneteenth, but every day uh, support the queer community, the trans community, the black community, the indigenous community who go widely underrepresented. They were, they have been the most persecuted of all uh, and we can't forget that. So that's about, <laughs> that's all I got. I think they covered it. Just to address one of the things you just mentioned, I I'm probably going to be interviewing somebody from the indigenous community here, if not the next episode, but probably the one after. Um, and I think most likely focusing on the issue of uh, disappearances of Native women. Um, but also, I mean, we're yeah. going to be discussing the, the solidarity amongst like uh, different communities of color as well. So I want to say one thing and then and, and then ask my co-host if she has any parting thoughts. And that is just what I'm learning and listening is that if nothing else, I can I have time to listen. Like if I'm not a wealthy person, if I'm not in the US right now, I mean, if I've got these, all these different excuses that I could try to assemble to say that, look, like I just don't, uh, I can't be included in the discussion right now, or I can't actively participate or be physically present. I got time to listen. And I think right. that just about everybody does. You can make time. It's a question of what you choose to make your priority. Um, and for me, I'm realizing for too long, because I don't want to sound like I'm patting myself on the back here, like for way too long, I did not make black lives a priority in my life. Um, I didn't make the, the cause of people of color in my own country. You know, as I spent a lot of time outside of my country, I did not make what was happening back home enough of a priority. You know, I kind of had this attitude like other people have got that. Um, but I don't think that I'm being a, Realizing my full obligations as a citizen, if I'm not addressing the plight of my fellow citizens, wherever I am. Right. I think that's an important step, though. And like, that's like you're giving. You could just as easily try to profit off me and Duck and the, or like any of these podcasts if you felt so need. But you're giving an opportunity to give people a chance to express their life, their voice and all of these things. And that's just, I mean, and that's a big, that's a big deal. It's not a little thing. It's a big thing, but like, even that just listening, just 
literally just pull someone aside and just listen to their story. No judgments, just sit and listen and, uh, and try to imagine how your life would be like if you had to go through the same things, you know? And it's just, that's the first step. Just understand that we're fucking human. Listen, and then act, then do something, then ask, how can I help? Or better yet, say it's the trouble of trying to tell you what to do and just go out and do it. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> and, you know, we hear you, we see you, we love you. Um, you're, I feel like I've known you just in this hour and 19 minutes that we've had together, and I can't wait to get to know you better and, and to support you in any way that I realize is uh, – helpful to you. I'm not going to ask you. I'm going to look for ways on my own. But um, I hope others do the same. I hope the others that watch this um, think about Sam's words, Duck's words, listen to the podcast because it gives you even more context and even more detail to their experience um, as a result of what occurred in Minneapolis uh, most recently with the murder of George Floyd. Um, we have to remember to say his name and to remember, you know, uh, what's happening is not a moment. It's the it's a movement that we have to, especially as uh, white people or non-white, non-black people of color, my fellow Arab Americans, anyone who's watching, um, we have to do better. We have to realize how the labor of black people, the unpaid labor of black people, has allowed us to be able to um, kind of fast track our success. Like immigrant communities have all faced different things, and I realized like my family came here in 1904. And we were able to be more successful, I think, than other communities because of the privileges um, and the being able to assimilate as white. I think my grandparents uh, were, who were born in the U.S. Uh, were able to pass as white even better than me because I'm so obsessed with like remembering my culture and my identity. And I, this is not about me, but I, I'm saying this to implore others who are watching that um, maybe relate to me as well, that, uh, you know, if what I say uh, can encourage you to do better, then please do better. <laughs> listen, right. to, listen to what Sam said and just know that we are here with you in solidarity. We too believe that Black Lives Matter and that they will only, that it's just, we are here with you and we're here with you for the long run. And um, I really appreciate you, you know, like, like I said earlier, gifting us your time to, um, to, uh, to connect with you and to um, yes. really learn. Thanks. Hell yes. No, seriously, again, thank you guys for giving me and Duck and many other people the opportunity to share their voice and this their story. And I mean, I think you can, there's a lot that can change within an hour and 22 minutes, you know, and there's a lot that just one story can make a huge impact. And so I thank you guys for allowing me to share this part of my life. You know, there's many other ass fun, great aspects we could get into, but thank you for like allowing me to dive into a part of my life that I don't necessarily talk about all the time or don't get to express a lot. So I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> And let's not make this the last time, man. You know? Right. No, seriously. Anytime you guys want to talk, yeah. I am. Yeah. <laughs> Get me before I write a book and profit. I know. Before you become this amazing doctor. There's so much that I can't wait to watch your journey. It's really cool. So to the people who are listening, uh, I would say consider this. Uh, what we've just recorded, we hope this is the first of a number of like live events like this. And also the podcast itself, consider these to also be something that you can share to help educate other people. You know, um, I mean, I hope I'm not out of place and correct me, Sam, if I'm wrong in, in asserting this, but I feel like a lot of times uh, people in the African American community, people of color in general, like they have the additional burden of having to explain things that they shouldn't have to explain to other people. And Mm -hmm. Part of the intention behind, honestly, this podcast more generally, but in particular, this most recent episode in this live event, this is a resource to kind of help spare you that effort, right? So if people right. share this around, then it, it, it can serve that function, you know, of at least giving people some background, some perspectives that they, that they 
that they might not get, you know, otherwise, um, and spare somebody else the the trouble of having to explain themselves, <laughs> give some people some context, you know, before their next conversation. Uh, right. So that's all I got. I mean, if, Sam, I'll give you the last word if you got anything you want to add. But other than that, I think we're good. No, just keep fighting the good fight. Black lives matter. Black trans lives matter. Indigenous lives matter. That's all we. That's all we can do. <laughs> Solidarity. Black lives matter. Solidarity on all these points. <laughs> it was so good talking to you guys. Like that. <laughs> All our love. Thank you so much, you guys. Stay safe. Right. You too. You too. Talk to you soon. Man. All right. Bye.